Good morning from Rabat. I hope you are as excited as I am about today's session. So the theme for our no talk today is the intersection of youth and technology, where we will be having a discussion on the role of AI. We will delve into the world of artificial intelligence and explore its implications for young entrepreneurs today. Before we deep dive, let me introduce you to our speaker for the day, Jordan Casey, who's joining us from London. Jordan is 23 year, years old, almost my age. We have just got the, the numbers messed up. Uh, Jordan is already an accomplished entrepreneur and software engineer. In his presentation today, Jordan will take us through his personal journey, the pros and cons of youth entrepreneurship, and a comprehensive understanding of AI. We will also explore different AI use cases across sectors. We will ponder on the ethical issues related to AI and, dis and discuss how AI can be a companion to human intelligence. So without further, further ado, let's give a warm welcome to Jordan Casey. Thank you for being with us, Jordan. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. I'm really, really excited. Um, should I just kick it off then? Yeah. Please do. Perfect. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Um, really, really excited to, to be here. Really excited to be working with um, the MBRF again and also with the UNDP. Um, so, yeah, as, as Stephanie has said, uh, my talk today is going to be delving in a little bit about my journey as a, a youth entrepreneur, a little bit about my story, some of the, the pros and cons and some of the obstacles I've faced during that journey. Uh, and then, yeah, uh, very excited to be talking a little bit about AI and artificial intelligence, uh, uh, a really, really exciting technology that's entered the mainstream very quickly um, within the last year. And we're going to address some of the some of the uh, exciting areas there. So without further ado, uh, let me give you a, a brief introduction to myself. Uh, I'm a 23 year old entrepreneur and software engineer from a, a small city called Waterford, which is in the, the southeast of Ireland. Um, I'm a public speaker and a youth advisor as well, and I'm very, very lucky to, to have worked in a number of technological fields, uh, which I'll, I'll get into just in a moment. Uh, before I, I talk about what I'm currently working on and before we don't dive into AI, briefly going to tell you a little bit about my story uh, and my journey as a, uh, a young entrepreneur. So for me, uh, I'm very, very lucky that I always felt that I was born with sort of a, an entrepreneurial mindset. Uh, in my head, I always wanted to, to be creating things and, and sort of wanting to be my own boss, even from a, a very, very young age. And um, growing up, I always sought for a different outlet to express my, my entrepreneurial mindset. So, for example, when I was six years old, I used to sell karate lessons to my friends, despite having zero um, knowledge of martial arts. Uh, I used to sell my my brother's old toys and new toys in garage sales to create my own retail business, and I always felt that I needed I needed something different. I needed a different outlet, uh, and very luckily for me, another area that I was fascinated by was the world of technology uh, and software, and especially video games. And for me, I was always trying to find a, a connection between my interest in technology and my entrepreneurial mindset in my eyes but that the interest in technology that i had could serve as the perfect outlet for for me to express my entrepreneurship the only problem is i didn't know how so growing up uh, i was very lucky to uh, have been given the chance to spend a lot of time playing video games um, and one of the games that i used to be particularly fond of was one called club penguin which for those of you who don't know is this online game where you play as this little penguin and you waddle around and you chat to friends and you play different games. What really interested me about Club Penguin though, that there was a niche community of young kids my age who were not only playing the game, but were also creating their own websites and blogs around it. And, and for me, this was a really, really interesting, interesting concept because these kids like me were creating something and we're, we're delivering to a community and basically it started their own businesses. And this, this completely fascinated me and was something that I really wanted to get my hands on because as I mentioned, that entrepreneurial mindset always drove me. And so uh, I did a little bit of research online. Uh, I started watching uh, lots of YouTube videos about how to, to create your own websites. 
uh, convinced my grandmother to, to buy me a, a coding for dummies book or a HTML for dummies book and gradually taught myself how to, to write computer code. So I launched my first website, which was a Club Penguin Cheat website. And then after a couple of months or a couple of years of, of making a website and writing posts about a game, I, I wanted to, to go into something further and I wanted to actually create my own games. The only problem is it's a lot more, it's a lot dif more difficult to create your own games and distribute your own games than it would be to, at the time, just release a blog or a website. And so I did a little bit more research and I stumbled across the iOS development kit or Xcode, which was the software tool that Apple have developed to allow young people, like not young people, but to allow anyone to create their own apps and games for iPhone. And so I saw this as a perfect opportunity as it would alleviate many of the distribution issues that I would have had as a young entrepreneur and would allow me to reach potentially millions of people with the click of a button if I developed my own, my own games. The only problem is to develop for iOS, you needed to have an Apple Mac. And I didn't have one of those uh, at, the, at the time. Being 11 years old, they seemed very, very, very expensive and still are. And so the only solution I could come up with was to convince my parents or try and trick my parents into buying me a Mac that I could develop games with. And so what I did was I illegally forged a letter pretending to be an executive at Apple and wrote down the pros and cons of uh, <laughs> buying a Mac for, for me to my parents. And they don't like me telling the story to this day, but um, they bought it and subsequently bought it as well. And so I, I had my Mac, I had my platform, and I was ready to start developing my own content. So I spent a couple of months working on different concepts and was really sort of treating it as a hobby because although I had that entrepreneurial mindset, it was still sort of a far fetch to me to see how I could actually create a business from this. Uh, but one game in particular that I released in 2012, which was called Alien Ball vs. Humans, uh, which was a very crude version of Space Invaders, uh, completely, completely changed everything for me. Uh, when I first released it, it was purely a hobby, an experiment, um, but somehow it just completely uh, exploded onto the markets. Uh, it it did, did really well. Uh, I was also crowned, I guess, the youngest iOS app developer in Europe. And all of a sudden, that pathway to entrepreneurship, that pathway to being my own boss and that pathway to running my own business suddenly became such, such more, much more attainable. And, and for me, basically opened my eyes to, to the world of, of, of entrepreneurship and also taught me that age is it's just a number. And so I've been very lucky that I started with my first business, Casey Games, through that, through that story. And then I've also been really lucky to have worked in a number of different fields from education uh, to, to gamification, combining games and education uh, to, to the likes of Bitcoin. Uh, and also now I'm really excited to be working in AI. Uh, as well as that, um, as well as my sort of the, the different businesses that I'm very lucky to work on, I also developed a huge, huge passion for, for youth entrepreneurship and, and promoting that and promoting tech literacy in young people. Uh, I felt that I was very, very lucky to be given an opportunity and a voice to, to, to share my story and to share what I've learned as a young entrepreneur. And I wanted to use that for good uh, to promote youth entrepreneurship for, for everyone and to, to show people that uh, uh, despite your age, you can do anything and kids should be 100% taken seriously. And so I've been very, very lucky over the past couple of years to have spoken over 300 events across the world um, from, from Colombia to the, the States to I'm very, very lucky to have been uh, all over the Middle East. I've been really lucky as well to have been in Dubai a, a couple of times as well, one of my favorite places in the world. And it's become a huge passion for me in, in sharing my, my story and, and sharing and sharing sharing the, the magic of youth entrepreneurship. Uh, as well as that, I've been very, very lucky to have worked in some some other areas. So uh, I, I work directly as a youth advisor with the with the European Commission for 10 years, uh, which is the a wing of the, the European Union. Uh, so I spoke, uh, I spoke and worked with uh, the commissioners there on delivering a, a digital agenda with a young person's perspective. As you can see there, I'm very, very proud uh, to have been awarded one of the 2018 Knowledge Ambassadors at the Dubai Knowledge Summit as well with the MBRF, which was a huge honor for me. And, and I also work um, again in, in, in Europe and here in the UK in 
in trying to sort of promote youth entrepreneurship and, and to to promote tech literacy in young people. And as you can see, I was very very lucky to to meet the the king um, the king uh, last year, which was great. Uh, another area that I'm really, really, uh, really happy to talk about, really, really love talking about is allowing myself to, to combine my passions, um, to combine my passions with youth entrepreneurship, with other interests. Um, as a tech developer and as a young kid uh, growing up, I was pretty, pretty on the shy side. And there was always this sort of reputation that if you're a tech entrepreneur, if you're a kid that's into computers and coding, that you can't have other interests or you don't go outside, but I'm very lucky that my parents in a little bit of a way sort of forced me down that avenue. And so I'm also a huge football fan. I've been very, very lucky to have worked with um, football clubs around the world, such as Real Madrid, uh, which is one of my my best uh, my best achievements, which I love talking about. Um, so that's a little bit in a nutshell about my story. Uh, after that, now I'd like to talk a little bit about the pros and cons of youth entrepreneurship. As I said, I've been really, really lucky and the achievements and, and all the opportunities I've had that I've just spoke about um, have been a dream. But at the same time, there are a few challenges surrounding my age and also the nature of, of myself as a young entrepreneur that I'd like to briefly talk about. So obviously, there are a huge amount of, of pros, I think. The main one for me that I love to talk about is is it, it acts as a head start for me. I'm so lucky that at the age of 11 or 12, I knew exactly one, what I wanted to do with my life and been working in the world of technology for, for 12 years now. And so when I first started speaking, I used to say when I was 12 in 10 years time, I'll be 22 and I'll already have 10 years experience in the industry. And now in 10 years, I'll be 32, 33, and I already have over 20 years of experience in the industry. And so for someone who feels like they have an idea and feels like age or circumstance might be a, a, a damaging factor, it's it, age is purely a number. And if you have uh, have an idea and you have a passion and you have a drive, definitely go for it. Uh, other advantages is because of my, my baby face, especially growing up, uh, it gives you an opportunity to, to stand out and be unique. And so, as I said, I've been really, really lucky that as a young person, uh, I've been invited to speak with in so many amazing events and to, to share my story and to promote youth entrepreneurship. And I do factor some of that down to uh, my age and to, to being different. And I think that it allows you to stand out. At the same time, there are some cons as well, or disadvantages or potential roadblocks I think people should, should be aware of. For example, the first one for me uh, is it can be hard to be taken seriously. Uh, when I was 12 and 13 and I was looking to, to raise investments or if I was seeking mentorship, at the same time of all the pros, there was also a little bit of an Achilles heel there that because of my age, it mightn't be, it mightn't be that I'm taken seriously. I, it might be that I'm, I'm doing this for a game or I'm, I'm, I'm not a real entrepreneur. And so trying to defy those stigmas has been a, a real challenge and has been quite deflating at times. But as I said, it's so, so important that if you have the belief and if you have the desire and the passion um, to, to, to drive on with it and to definitely to definitely pursue it. The second one, and I really like to touch on this because it was so, so important for me when I was when I was growing up, is just to have a structure and, and to have balance. Uh, for me as a young entrepreneur coming up and for many uh, who might be listening today, uh, as well as our businesses and our passions, we may have school or education or university. And this massive block of time in our day uh, cuts, cuts, cuts a lot of opportunity out, I feel. And was I'm definitely what, what I'm trying to say is school and education is incredibly important, but it's so, so important also to have a balance between working on your businesses, getting your education and also just living your life as well. Uh, I, I've been in so many positions where I, I lost structure and I lost sight for a while and focused everything on my business or ran out of ruts and I just found so much burnout and I just think it's so so important to have a structure and to have a balance I also think it's hugely important to, to have a support network around you for me as a young entrepreneur my parents and my friends were, were hugely supportive of me and definitely imply, uh, apply that as well just going to try and speed up a little bit because I uh, just want to get into the, the world of AI very quickly. So briefly now, before we jump into AI for a couple of minutes, uh, I just have a couple of talking points as a, as a young entrepreneur. 
The first one uh, is to take advantage of the resources in front of you. Uh, as, as a young generation, we are so, so, so lucky to have been born into a world um, with the internet where we have millions of free resources, millions of networks, uh, and millions, millions of pieces of knowledge on the internet that we can use to, to, to leverage and learn and grow. For me, if I wanted to develop a computer game in the 80s, I would have had to buy an old clunky Commodore 64, buy loads of books to help me without any sort of support network, build a game, then try and sell the game to a massive publisher and then hopefully get it into store and have people buy it. If I wanted to develop a game now, get my computer, go on YouTube, look up how to make a game. And then once I'm ready to distribute it, I can reach billions of people with the click of a button. So it's, it's a huge one for me. Second one, have your conviction beat self-doubt 80 to 90% of the time. As I said, it's so, so important to have a motivation and to have a drive. But I also think it's important to have a little bit of, of self-doubt as well. I, I think it, it, it's what keeps me hungry. It, what, it, it's what keeps me on my toes and it's what keeps me motivated. And the third one before we jump into the world of AI is just to never give up. Um, it's a little bit cliche, but as I said, I've had so many obstacles down the line. I've had so many pitfalls where I've just been like, maybe it's time to just throw it in. But because I've had that determination, because I've had that drive, it's it's kept me on my feet. And so that's that's my advice to you. So as I said, I've been very, very lucky to have been working in the world of AI for the last year or so. Um, it's a it's a concept that's blown up hugely within the the last six months with the the, the onset of, of GPT. And I briefly just like to give a, a sort of beginner's introduction to what AI is, how young entrepreneurs can use it, and, and any any entrepreneur can use it to their benefit right now, and and where I think it's heading. So briefly before I I go into it, AI refers to the simulation of human intelligence and machines that are programmed to think and learn like robots. It's been a, a, a concept that's been around since the 50s, and many people credit Alan Turing with being the, the inventor of it. And we've seen AI grow uh, decade upon decade with new technologies such as machine learning, such as big data. And now we're starting to see deep learning, uh, deep learning and neural networks because of the amalgamation of the two. Uh, AI use cases, as we all know, is it's using customer service and chatbots, recommendation system, autonomous vehicles, fraud detection and virtual assistance, and also personalized marketing. And there's a, a brief timeline of how it's grown from the Dartmouth conference in the 50s to deep learning and neural networks is what we know now. But the 2020s is what I really want to focus on and, and what has happened the last couple of years because of exponential growth uh, and how innovation um, indicates that AI is going to be the next big thing. Uh, and AI for all is, is something that's happened now. I think because of the onset of ChatGPT and because of what has happened the last couple of years, uh, it's, been, it's been basically opened up for everyone. Um, and as you can see, some of the, 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 the world uh, of AI and some of the companies that are using AI right now, I think it all sort of starts with OpenAI and ChatGPT. And, and most of these technologies are now utilizing GPT in, in, some, in some way or form. So Google have their BARD. Microsoft to have um, their Bing chat, Amazon are leveraging it now. And it's it's a really, really exciting uh, exciting tool. But as we said, we touched on briefly, there are also some ethical issues around AI. So the first one is, is around accountability and transparency. Uh, AI systems can sometimes make complex decisions that are difficult to interpret or explain. And so sometimes it's very hard to ha have accountability and have someone stand over it. Uh, bias and fairness is another issue that I think has come up quite a lot. Um, AI algorithms can in inadvertently inherit and perpetuate biases, but also the developers and the, the overseers of AI have the ability to, to program their, their artificial intelligence to have any, thought, any thoughts or ideas that they basically want. And recently we've seen that AI likes to lie. Uh, and although it is unten unintentional in imitating humans, because humans often lie as well, uh, it does have the ability to often supply false information. And so detecting accuracy is another issue that can arise as well. But I think AI is a black swan event like, like no other, to be honest. I think we've had a couple of black swan events over the last two decades. I think the internet is a huge one. And I think iPhones and smartphone technology is also a huge one. The internet took about 20 years to really take over the world. Uh, I think smartphones took about 10 years, maybe even less to take over the world. And what I think is going to happen with AI is going to be 
much more quicker, much more advanced, and a little bit scary. So as you can see in this document here, uh, GPT-3, which was the main proponent of, of ChatGPT, which was uh, released in October last year, had 175 billion endpoints or pieces of data and information to learn on. Within less than three months, when GPT-4 was first announced in January, that had grown 1,750 times to 100 trillion endpoints and 100 trillion data, data pieces, basically. And this exponential growth is just the way that um, AIs can compound and learn off of each other uh, at a, a huge, huge rate. And because we're we're using ChatGPT and providing it with relevant information, uh, it 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 is a little bit it is a little bit scary. But at the same time, it presents an opportunity. I, I think we're in a world of what's called right now AI complementarianism, where humans and artificial intelligences are beginning to learn and understand off each other through trial and error. And so I think it, it presents a huge opportunity for any young entrepreneur who's interested in learning more about AI or leveraging it. Because as I said, this is an exponential growing market. I think it's going to change the world in, in a matter of years. And I think that if anyone has an idea in AI or has an idea to leverage it, now is the time to get into it because there's a very small window open. And I really think that it's, a, it's an exciting, exciting path. And so I'm just going to try and briefly just before I just finish up, because I know I've gone a little bit over time, just talk about the benefits of ChatGPT. For anyone that's not used it before, ChatGPT is the sort of main proponent of mainstream AI right now. And it's essentially a live chatbot or virtual assistant that you can use to leverage your ideas, to make uh, your business processes more efficient, and also just to use it for idea generation. Uh, it's, it's free to use right now. Um, and basically, I use it for a huge amount of things for as a, a virtual assistant, uh, I use it for content generation, market research and, and creating marketing content and also knowledge application. Uh, ChatGPT has the ability to apply knowledge. So, so, for example, me as a computer programmer or to someone as a marketer or someone that works in, in retail or food and apply knowledge and apply questions you have to your business and your use case specifically rather than just a generic Google search, which is one of the reasons I think it's really, really cool. Um, prompts are input instructions or queries provided to ChatGPT that give a desired response. Uh, and in the context of conversational AI, I think prompts and the way you communicate with ChatGPT is really, really important. I think you have to be super specific with, with ChatGPT. And this is where I'm sort of talking about that AI complementarianism. Um, so for example, if you have a prompt and you want something to apply to your business, this is a, a basic example. You can ask it a generic question like, what are some good restaurants in Dubai? But unless you specify exactly what you want from ChatGPT, you can't expect it to interpret it correctly or, or to your full desire. And so I definitely recommend having more in-depth, more, more specific prompts to get the desired answer that you seek because it does have the ability to give you that. Um, and so, yeah, I guess uh, I was just going to do a, a brief case study as well, but I just think I'm after going a little bit uh, over time there. But I definitely, if you have any questions on ChatGPT, um, for sure, put them at me. Um, working on a couple of other things myself right now. So uh, Hub is my my consultancy business. Verify21 is my business that I work in, in in Bitcoin. And Sprio is my AI business, which is what I'm working on right now. And I'm looking to provide a one-stop shop tool for, for small businesses to leverage AI in all areas uh, in all areas of their, their operation. Um, and so, yeah, definitely um, really, really enjoyed today. Uh, hopefully you guys have some questions for me. And uh, sorry if I've gone a little bit over time there, but uh, thank you so much for, for your time. Thank you so much, Jordan. Um, that was like, a very informative and inspiring presentation, especially for young entrepreneurs who are navigating this complex world of artificial intelligence and technology. Um, we are starting to have questions from the audience. Um, if you if you have not uh, put your question in the chat in the Q and A section, please you can still do that. Uh, we are having really nice question. I have some of my own, and okay. I'm, I'm I'm going to start. Uh, I'm going to take some from the audience. Um, 
I, I love this idea of uh, complementarianism and like th these concepts you have, like I didn't, I didn't know that there was a term for it. Um, but, uh, but first I have a, I have a question for you and I think the audience has the same question. Like, what is your favorite game, for example? <laughs> <laughs> um, good question. I don't get a huge amount of time to play games anymore. I'm a big football fan, so I play a lot of FIFA. But the game I, I sort of credit for inspiring me a lot is Minecraft. I feel like um, Minecraft presents so many opportunities for, for creative people. It provides, provides an outlet to, to be creative. There's, there's no restrictions or barriers. Um, and it's a really good collaborative, collaborative tool as well. So most of the things I know about teamwork and working in team, I've kind of gathered from Minecraft. And also the story behind Minecraft as well is hugely inspiring for me. The fact that one guy was able to create this massive empire that I think changed the world uh, is a huge one for me. So Minecraft definitely is uh, is my favorite game. Great, thank you. Um, so we cannot talk AI without asking a question about the ethical issues. And you have mentioned you have mentioned that like briefly. Um, if you could propose a solution to one of these issues, which one would it be, and what would your solution look like? <laughs> it's it's a it's a tricky one they're definitely i i definitely do, do think um I, I i do follow elon musk a lot and uh he's uh he's one of the founders of course of, of open ai which did release chat gpt and over the past few months he's expressed a lot of concern about the, the ethical issues and the potential dangers that ai can pose because it is such a such a powerful tool um I, he he's his solution is is regulation and finding a, a balance between allowing developers to to be creative and to create these really really exciting tools but I think I, I would probably agree with him that some oversight is probably needed um just I just think it's such an amazing amazing tool but I think if put in the wrong hands it, it definitely has the the potential to to be yeah, it'd be a little bit scary, but I think I think I think regulation might be a, a solution. But again, a balance between allowing developers to have the creativity and to have that openness to work on these exciting ideas, whilst also allowing that sort of level of protection uh, over it as well. Great. You have mentioned how education is crucial for innovation. How do you see AI changing the landscape of education? That's an another good question. Um, yeah, I, I'm. Yeah, as I said, I'm really, really passionate about education. One of the areas I always used to work on was was tech literacy and 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 teaching kids how to to better utilize technology for their education. But I suppose now with ChatGPT and and how that's worked, I think uh, it's posed a lot of issues for for teachers and 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 maybe some schools with with kids um, being a little bit creative and using ChatGPT for their work. Ultimately, I think. And it's it's a little bit long winded, but ultimately, I think the the scope of education will have to change. I think education and the way we teach in schools is one of the core pillars that hasn't really been impacted hugely by technology. Of course, we do have technology in schools, but the way we teach and the way we learn has been the same for for hundreds of years now. And and I'm more in favor of promoting a collaborative, creative learning process where the teacher learns from the student just as much as the student learns from the teacher and so whether ai now poses this this issue where our homework and the way we study can just be generated by this intelligence might have to force us to rethink are we teaching the right way uh should we ju be judging somebody's intelligence based on their ability to to remember information on a page or should we be judging their intelligence or their creativity on areas that they are interested in and also how they collaborate and how they create themselves. It's really like a sort of a change in curricula, like old curricula are not, do not match the the current, uh, like they are not aligned with uh, with this exponential technological change we are, we are witnessing. Absolutely, absolutely agree, yeah. Yeah, and speaking of chat GPT, and you are, all, you are also, you have also highlighted its, its use cases. Um, how do you see AI AI powered virtual assistants evolving in the future? Um, yeah, I think it's 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 really really it's again really exciting. I just I think there's no limitations to to how AI can can function. I think what we're starting to see now is uh, developers and technology companies um, trying to humanize these virtual assistants a little bit more. So obviously we have the power of ChatGPT. 
But what we also have are really, really innovative AI voice generators. So being able to generate like human voices. Um, we have obviously these really scary like deep fake technologies and, and uh, the ability to create people using AI. So I think it, it, it's it's definitely going to, to to go down that direction. I think people are more comfortable when they when they have a face to talk to rather than a, a bot that they know that they're they're chatting to. And I, I do think it's a little bit scary, but I think eventually there it'll be hard to tell the difference. And I, I think that's that's the way the way way it's heading. I think it's trying to humanize this technology. Um, it's trying to to yeah definitely expand it as well. Like ChatGPT four is just just the beginning, and as I said, the amount of information there is is massive. But I I think I think the direction that I I see currently happening is the event uh, attempts to humanize and and put a face on all of these uh all of these neural networks. Yeah, and on the human side, like what are some some soft skills that you think we need to develop with the rise of AI? Yeah, definitely. I think I think as I said, we're really really lucky that we're in an, an area of AI complementarianism where we will be having a sort of trial and error relationship with AI. Where right now it's a process where we tell it what we want it to do, it comes back with a response. We don't really we don't we don't know if it's the right response or we're not happy with the response, and then we go and we tinker it. So I think for anyone that's only sort of touching the surface with AI or just jumping into it. I think definitely spend a little bit of time messing around with, with ChatGPT, uh, understanding the prompts, um, understanding how you can apply it to your business um, and, and, and giving it as much detail as possible. Um, as, as well as that, then, uh, yeah, I think that, that I think that is the, the, the big the big takeaway. I'm trying to just promote ChatGPT and that fundamental introduction to AI as much as possible because I think once people start to apply it to their own use case and their own business and can see the results that it can generate they will understand the, the power it has um, from there on in and it'll it'll only get more more advanced from there I guess yeah and just people like they just need to try it themselves and discover uh, use cases that are relevant to them totally yeah exactly yeah. I think it's 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 yeah. If it, it right now, if we want to apply a use case or something to our business, we we can go on Google and we can put in a search result. But it's always going to be, uh, it's it's never going to be one hundred percent accurate or one hundred percent relatable. And with ChatGPT, if you can provide the information about your business to it, it it becomes a huge, hugely more advanced and and hugely more relative and something that we can then interpret and understand ourselves. Yeah, you are talking now about now about accuracy, and in your in your presentation, you mentioned how AI can sometimes like like to lie, mm. or provide inaccurate information. Yeah. Can you tell us about the time when you had to deal with this issue? Uh, for me, so I'm as a, as a software engineer, I've been um, using ChatGPT a lot to to help me um, with with snippets of code and to to have it do some programming for me. And we've had a couple of arguments back and forth before where I know something is incorrect because of the code it provides me with um, and, and, and also that I can, I, can, I, I can understand it. So it has been a lot of just basic like, issues like that where it's just like it's, it's convinced of something and it's, it, it's pushing a certain narrative, a certain direction how to do something just because of the way it's built up knowledge. Whereas I would know myself as a programmer that there's another way to do that or a better way to do that. And, and then there is sort of, as I said, like it, it's the AI is built to imitate humans and to act as as though humans would act, and especially obviously the developers behind it. And so, whilst it does have the ability to lie and interpret information, I think it is it is because it's trying to attempt it to do that. So as as it becomes more and more advanced, um, it's it's going to go down either two directions. It's going to become incredibly incredibly accurate or it's just going to take on opinions and beliefs of its own. And I guess that's just the way we sort of structure it. I think that's sort of the question around how does regulation work with AI? Um, but yeah, either way, it's going to be interesting to say the least. Yeah. Yeah, you are saying regulations. What are some other hopes that you have regarding the use of AI? Um, I I really, really, really like uh like everything that you like the, the auto autonomous cars i think that's a self-driving cars are a really interesting area for me um i also am interested to see how it works with the world of gaming though 
Um, usually now with, with game developers, we have to sort of build and work in this sort of static environment. Whereas with AI, we could have dynamically generating games and dynamically generating content that could potentially, with the power of like high, high end computing, be built in real time. So if you could tell AI that you want to play a game in a certain location or in a certain environment with certain powers and certain certain roles, there's there's no real limitations to how it couldn't do something like that. So I really, really want to see how it applies to the world of, of entertainment, gaming. Um, we saw a couple of weeks ago, Apple uh, announced their new VR headset. And one of the companies that they're working with are Disney. And it has the ability to basically render a real life Mickey Mouse in, in your living room that you can interact with. But if you can build a, an artificial intelligence around a character that is is in its mind Mickey Mouse, you can basically have a conversation with that sort of character. So it's a little bit it's a little bit different, but the world of entertainment, I think, is going to change um, dramatically because of AI. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so. Um... Like yesterday, it was World Refugee Day, okay? And uh, you mentioned like some AI use cases. How can it impact the lives of refugees and improve refugee aid operations in uh, like in what ways do you think? Um, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, hmm. I, definitely, I definitely think that and especially with the with the technologies that we have available now with with chat gpt like i i'm not entirely sure how i could apply it directly but i just think the the expanse of education and the knowledge space that the chat gpt and all of these ais have right now um continues to to provide a really really exciting and previously closed off technology uh, to everyone and allows so many people, regardless of, of the, the situation or where they might find themselves to, to be able to apply it and to learn from it. And was yeah, I think I think there definitely will be huge opportunities to leverage it um, in, in the context of refugees and and, 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 and and that sort of area. I think right now, I, I think just what it has done in the past few months and just opening it up to, to everyone and 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 allowing people to 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 use this technology, I think, um, and yeah, anyone can can use it and and and, and leverage it uh, to to whatever they want to do. Really, yeah. Yeah, I definitely agree with you. Um, like uh, knowledge has never been more accessible, and now with the use of AI, like we, we are having accessibility more and more. Yeah. So so this is great, especially for uh, the more marginalized communities as well definitely yes. yeah. so this is it with the questions but now we have a lighter a lighter section with this or that questions okay and i hope it will still be thought-provoking okay Deadly. yeah so when it comes to ai do you envision a data-driven utopia or a machine-led dystopia <sighs> are <question>. you hopeful <laughs> <laughs> i I tend to be a pessimist when it comes to things, but I, I, I do think that because of, because of the mainstream entrance of AI and because um, people that wouldn't usually be involved in technology, billions of people are are starting to to realize its capabilities. I think that will will force force us to to all sort of consider um, what we do and how we use this technology. So I would be hopeful, and the way it's kind of going right now, it seems to be like a data-driven utopia. But like as 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 you mentioned there, like it um yeah there it's it it could be a lot closer to 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 one or the other, I think. But let's let's keep our fingers crossed. Yeah, uh, for problem solving, algorithms or creativity. <laughs> uh, I I that's a, that's that's a good one as well. Um. I think I think creativity for me. I um I think and, and again this this might be a little bit distorted because of the AI's ability to now be creative. So basically algorithms now have the ability to be creative themselves, um, which doesn't really make logical sense, but that's that's the way it's heading right now. But I think for me, um as an entrepreneur and as a developer, creativity is is where I I, I solve mo most of my issues and, and it allows me to break down logic. It allows me to think outside the box. 
And importantly, it allows me to collaborate as well. So whether it be my, my team members who might have experience with different problems as well, or people in different fields, uh, being creative and um, all sort of being able to speak the same language as such uh, allows us to sort of um, solve them quicker. But al algorithms have their place as well. Yeah, uh, you have mentioned Elon Musk. So I kind of know your, your answer to this question. Uh, when it comes to AI evolution, do you prefer a rapid innovation or a slow and steady one? Yeah, I think I think a slow, a, definitely a, sl a slow and steady. Ideally, one uh, one that has a bit of both. So, like, I think a balance is really important. Like, as I said, um, uh, we sh we need to be able to allow our developers to 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 be creative and to to invent these new ideas. I don't think any attempts we bring in to stagnate or or slow down AI should stagnate that progress and that innovation because that's what drives us all forward. Whereas at the same time, we do have to recognize that there are potential dangers not dangers but potential sort of issues that 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 do come with that as well so i think finding the right balance between that is is hugely important but but yeah i think um managing it is also uh is also key yeah now the last question uh regarding the future of ai do you envision more personalization or more privacy oh that's uh, that's a good one as well i think I think definitely more more personalization. To be honest, I think that's just the uh, the way the way we're heading, and I, I know there's a, a huge concern around around privacy, and and it does also provide the opportunity with if you want to use AI technology to ensure that. Um, but I just yeah, I think I think we're going to be living in a a personalized world where everything we do, watch, use, touch is just going to have some personalization to it like i watched um i recently watched an episode of black mirror on netflix uh where it created this episode called joan is awful and what it basically did was it create used an ai and quantum to computers to create a tv show around every single person's life and i just think that that is exactly the the kind of way we're headed i think the content we want to watch and the games we want to play the way we work is all just going to be personalized down to our own detail around touch and I think AI is is going to be the driving force behind that. Um, so I think it probably is the way we're headed. But privacy is important as well, I, I must stress. Yeah. Let's wait and see and cross fingers. Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much, Jordan. And I apologize, I apologize for the hard questions, but you have done so well. And uh, thank you. We are very grateful for you sharing very valuable insights and experiences. And I am sure that, that each one of us today has gained a deeper understanding of AI, its implications and its potential form uh, and its, its potential. So uh, I'd also like to thank the, the audience for their active participation in this discussion and the conversation doesn't end here. Let's continue exploring, ask questions and dive deeper into the world of technology. Thank you so much, uh, everyone, and we look forward to seeing you at our next NOTOC event.